Welcome to our study of Journey Without Goal, the Tantric Wisdom of the Buddha, which is Chegyam Trungpa Rinpoche's um, exposition of the view, the spirit, and to some extent also the, an understanding of the method of Vajrayana. But of course here, we are, it's not as if we are what's called breaching the secret door of Vajrayana in the sense of um, teaching Vajrayana um, techniques as such. But at the same time, um, it is necessary to have some understanding of what Vajrayana is about, and particularly then in the, um, in the modern day, where thanks to our very, um, what do we call it, multicultural, global um, environment, we inevitably are exposed to so many different cultures, including Vajrayana culture. And Vajrayana culture very often is misunderstood. And so um, it's very important actually that we gain some understanding of Vajrayana and particularly then um, how, the, how Vajrayana, you could say the logic of Vajrayana fits with, with the rest of the Buddhist teaching. So as always, um, as always, the teachers of the lineage, they would always encourage that when you set about to study or practice, that there is uh, a perspective that applies, an understanding that of the relevance, the value of this, of this study or practice in terms of understanding the suffering that prevails in the world. And this is not just an empty cliche about, you know, um, develop a nice uh, attitude, but it's really based on the recognition that all the suffering that we have in the world, <coughs> we could say that the suffering that's perpetrated by individual subjectivities come from what we could call toxic subjectivities that suffer from this innocent condition of ignorance. And that is where what we would generally refer to as sentient beings, they universally suffer from this delusional, um, this delusional condition of self in which there's not really an understanding of reality. And so within this complete misperception of reality, this hallucination that then is referred to as samsara, there's nothing but suffering. On a very sort of real level, we can see that when we look at the various crimes that are perpetrated in the, in the name of aggression or greed or whatever it might be, universally, if we switch on the news, then we can see, we can trace back the, the, the cause of these crimes, these, what we would sometimes think of as incredibly stupid actions. Uh, we can trace that back to this condition of self-centering, that there is a sense of I, my agenda versus the agenda of other, me versus the other, us versus them, nations versus nations, tribes versus tribes, individuals versus individuals, or just the, the various styles of insecurity that play out, again, based on self. So in a way, we could say homework for, for part of our Buddhist um, study is very much looking at the news and identifying where does it come from because it's very easy to sort of getting caught up in the blame game and sort of just ridiculing politicians or ridiculing this that and the other or blaming this that and the other but if we actually analyze if we use our intelligence and analysis and we go down and see where do these actions come from then we come down to this place this toxic place of this insecurity of I or us. And this, this is what really drives the suffering of samsara, of course, where the relevance of this then applies is that this is based on the Buddha's vision that actually this, delu this sense of self is actually delusional. It's not just that we should adopt a nice Buddhist moralistic sort of attitude and sort of a practice where we will be selfless 
but it's would rather we should look and see there actually is no self. There actually is nothing but a misconstruction of our individual self and the other. There's a labeling and there's an assumption around self. But if we look at the individual, the person, this is nothing but a continual changing of causes and conditions. And similarly, all the objects in the phenomenal world, all the so-called realities that we deal with, they are they they all exist independently or rather they they the way that we perceive these the way that we label these things and solidify them this is what consolidates this delusional experience that is basic to our suffering and so we're not going to get, um, how do you say free ourselves through dreaming or going into sort of a nice cultural practice that we call Vajrayana or a lovely sort of a vacation into something that's nice and distracting. But it's actually more about us looking, taking a hard look at our reality and identifying the delusional projections that apply to ourselves and also to our experience of the phenomenal world. And so this is where we left off last time because <clears throat> of course we could very well say well that sounds great but how exactly do we do that and that's where Trungpa Rinpoche here just in the initial discussion of uh, of this work then begins to identify how we practically need to engage in the practice of shamatha and vipassana and with that we actually begin to emerge or get out of our heads we begin to get out of our own particular projections and narratives and begin to actually connect with the world around us and we begin to actually take delight in relating to the world around us so so this is where we uh, presently left off in the discussion Let's see here if there's any so so Trungpa Rinpoche then continues, because of the discovery of egolessness in shamatha and the development of interest and sympathy in vipassana, we naturally begin, naturally begin to expand our sense of warmth and friendliness to others. We are less interested in this I, me, and more interested in that. The Mahayana path is based on this discovery that others are more important than ourselves. Because we have discovered egolessness, because we have discovered that me does not exist, we find that there's lots of room, lots of space in which to help others. That is the basis of compassion, karuna. Compassion in the Buddhist tradition is not based on guilt. It's based on having greater vision because we can afford to do so. So what in fact we cover here in this paragraph, this simple paragraph, is actually the foundations uh, of the Vajrayana journey which is, you could say, presumed. And even though we might not, um, and what that in fact sums up here is practically no less than the, than the foundations of what we could refer to as the Hinayana and the Mahayana, the discovery of egolessness uh, in shamatha, us beginning to step out of our fascination with our thinking, the absence of distraction, and in that sense, breaking the shell this sort of self-absorption that we very often find ourselves in and beginning to actually discover there's a world out there besides me, then there is this emerging of warmth and friendliness and that's implicit in the entire path. And that is the, 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 that which gives rise to the warmth and the engagement, participation in the world, which is not based on my agenda, but is based on this greater vision of compassion. And so this is the, this, this single paragraph really sums up the, the entire, you could say, the, the journey. But what's significant in this is that hopefully that this, this, the logic applies, that we can understand what we mean with egolessness and we can see where ego takes place and where we could penetrate or cut through this cycle of ego and that's where we luckily in the buddha's teaching and what's implicit in the buddha's teaching is the 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 quality the, the presence of a path we have a method we have meditation and that's where shamatha and vipassana apply we can do something about this it's not just that we can we can we can we can bemoan the fact that there's ego but we can actually do something about this 
And that's where with if we have some sense of the vision and some sense of the method, then what we're discussing here makes tremendous sense. And implicit in that is then with the discovery of egolessness is the, the discovery of the other and the engagement of the other. Of course, all of us live with the other, but very often the other is a problem. <laughs> It's like, how do, can we get the others to comply with our particular wants and needs? So that's where here we, we actually go beyond wants and needs and begin to expand into com this dimension of caring for the other, compassion. Tumparunja, by the way, and this is very much basic to Majamika speak, talks about duality in terms of the division between this and that, which is once we, we assert one objective reality, it stands, it only exists in relationship to other. And that's where the, the dissolution of these, if we see through the delusion of labeling things this way, then and what comes with it, namely that we begin to see other things in relation to it as that. If we begin to see through that, then we begin to, this is the discovery of, of non-duality. And also in the sense of I and other. So this is where, where uh, Tumbrum, which is vocabulary, very often operates with the, um, this in terms of the subjective self and that more in terms of the projected other. Tumbrum, which continues, the Mahayana teachings are profound and vast. And what I'm presenting here is like a drop in the ocean of the Mahayana Dharma. Nevertheless, helping others is absolutely essential. This is true, not only in Mahayana practice, but in Vajrayana as well. Trying to practice Vajrayana without compassion is like swimming in molten lead. It is deadly. All the power and the magic of Vajrayana is based on working for the benefit of others and surrendering ourselves absolutely. So what we could say generally has happened to us is that our, our natural purity has been hijacked by ignorance. And yet, this natural condition always is there. Vajrayana is so much about the recognition of the original purity. But engaging in Vajrayana without the recognition of this purity and continuing on engaging in Vajrayana practice with, without the, um, the connecting to our original purity, without the what was just discussed, the foundations of egolessness and compassion, then all the method and the very powerful method of engaging with the world, working with the world, working with our own subjective existence and working with our uh, experience of the world around us, if that is, if the Vajrayana method there is, is not based on a foundation of recognizing this purity, then all we're doing really is perpetuating the causes of suffering. So that's where there has to be this foundation of openness, egolessness, compassion. Trumpa Rinpoche continues, the Vajrayana teachings are very precious. They're very close to my heart and they are my inheritance. So I do not pass them on lightly. Still, I am delighted that we can present Tantra in the American world. What is presented here is like a map. It is, entirely, it is an entirely different experience to actually making the journey. It requires a guide to make the journey. And as well, we must make proper preparations. Um, our minds must be tamed and trained through the practice of meditation. Only then can we see the Vajra world. So Thumpa Rinpoche wants to introduce the reality, the reality of who we are, the reality of our world. This we could call the Vajra world. This, this vision of the luminous nature of reality, that is, was the discovery of the Buddha. This is particularly uh, celebrated in the Vajrayana teaching. And yet it's something that's easily subject to uh, confusion. And so Trungpa Rinpoche presently presenting this as he did, and this was, I think we saw it, this was given at the uh, one of the first um, sort of Buddhist summer camps in the Ropa Institute in 1974. Um, this was made possible because Trungpa Rinpoche had actually mastered the vernacular 
of the um, well, the American world, which was extraordinary. Um, I don't think there's any American that wouldn't have been impressed with Trump Rinpoche's ability to understand uh, American culture and the mastery of the uh, contemporary language. And um, in that situation, and this of course was based very much on this extraordinary condition of the openness, the intelligence of the students, and the caring uh, of the teacher. This caring that was not put off by, you could say, the uh, sort of uh, colonialist arrogance that very often prevailed in terms of meeting um, Asian teachers or sort of a naive fascination with the far outness of uh, an Asian teacher, et cetera, et cetera. All these sort of various ways of um, alienation between two cultures. Trump and Jim managed actually to patiently uh, work with that and go beyond that and tr presented Buddhism in an incredibly sophisticated way and the students also appreciated this so with that sort of incredible situation then there was very much I think the basis for Trump Rinpoche really passing on his inheritance what really is sort of the core teachings of the of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition namely the, the Vajrayana so as he said, and then Trumpen says, as I have said, presenting these talks originally was quite demanding, but it was equally worthwhile. For those who connected with what was being transmitted, the experience of hearing these lectures was one of discovering devotion and beginning to s surrender ego. It is my hope that, in a similar fashion, this book will inspire others to step onto the path of Dharma. Bhadracharya, the Venerable. Chigam Trumpa Rinpoche, 10th of July, 1981, Boulder, Colorado. So, <clears throat> so this, um, this is then a number of years later than when this book was, was published and Trumpa Rinpoche wrote this forward. Mm -hmm. Are there ways are there ways? Okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, just in regard, this will be the last question I take before actually uh, the end of the session. Last time we were a little bit inundated with questions. And so um, what I thought to do is to um, to start question, question period 10 minutes before we end. I'll try to make my question, my answers a little bit shorter than I usually do. But then again, also, we might go over time and then it's fine. We can go over time a little bit. Shouldn't be a problem. But anyway, then those who wish to to uh, log off at 10, they can do so. So we'll we'll start with the questions at at, um, at 10 to 10. So in half an hour's time. Yeah. Now, by the way, what I'm going to do here because we have a, a very very beautiful uh, devotional liturgy, uh, crying to the gurus from afar. Um, what I'm going to do is is just do sections of that every time. And then basically um, continue with the with the text. Uh, other than that, we'd we'd be using quite some time. And in fact, there's so much, so many references within this text that actually requires um, some familiarity with the the Vajrayana universe that it makes sense to sort of um, sort of continuing with the study as we gradually make our way through this. So I'm just going to do a through few slokas of this uh, this chant. At the beginning of every session, and then continue with the with the chapters on with the teaching. So this is a very beautiful um, practice called uh, calling or crying to the gurus from afar. In Tibetan, it's called Lama Gyangbe, which means um, yeah, calling, crying. Um, it's devotional, and uh, it should. We would sometimes say you can't practice guru yoga with dry eyes. You can't come to the Vajrayana without being touched. You can't come, come there with an analytical apparatus. Um, and that's because what, we are, what is really key to the Vajrayana is what we call blessing, which is a softening of our ordinarily, um, um, you could say, very um, intense degree of uh, being caught up in our own thinking and emotionality and so forth, so that it takes up all the space, the whole drama around me. 
But something can happen, and this is what we refer to as blessing, is that there can be the presence of the teacher that touches us to the extent that actually the other concerns just melt away. Yes, we're still present in the world, we're still dealing with the world, but we're not overwhelmed with the world. There's a, there, there is a place where the presence of the teacher touches us deeply. And so, um, so the, the practice of Guru Yoga and the practice of engaging with the teacher needs to have that component, or rather the two components of the student being um, devoted or open to the teacher, appreciating the brilliance of the teacher, and then on the basis of that and the teacher's genuine qualities, something wonderful can happen, which is then this, this quality of being touched in the sense of that bypasses the sort of front offices and the bureaucracy of the ordinary rational mind and touches us deep, deep within. And that is, of course, also synonymous with the practice of faith. We need to have um, been processed with a good deal of hard intelligence, skepticism, critical thinking before we engage in the practice of faith. But at the same time, also, there is a place where we do feel genuinely inspired by someone. And if, if, we, if we encounter a teacher and this teacher uh, inspires us and we then on the basis of our own inquiry, critical thinking, skepticism, and so forth, uh, can assert the validity of this teacher. And this, of course, is not easy, and particularly in our day and age, not easy at all. But we should also pay attention to the tradition, which itself very much encourages being critical and careful. But once that has come into place, if the extraordinary situation of a genuine teacher is there, together with the openness of a student, then the presence of the teacher touches the student um, to a degree that goes beyond the ordinary um, spiritual qualities that could be sort of worked on through a, a rational, gradual process. Uh, we often have that this situation happen when there's a great teacher that, that comes. And I very often think of people who have attended the teachings of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who, even though they might not be Buddhist, and that's, you could say, the strength of someone like the Dalai Lama, that he has such a presence within the ordinary world, the, the secular world or the non-Buddhist world, that very often people go and see the Dalai Lama just because he's got a great, you know, you know, great reputation. And despite not being Buddhist, despite not perhaps sharing some of the, um, the, um, the, the culture and the teachings that the Dalai Lama presents, then people are touched. And very often people emerge from a, a teaching of the Dalai Lama or some other guru actually have, be having been softened. They come out of there and it's not about just the hard logic of the teaching that really sort of makes sense, but it's actually a softening up, a genuine sense of something that has shifted. And that we could call blessing. So it's something that actually goes beyond the ordinary gradual spiritual development and right immediately there goes straight in and touches that sort of core of basic goodness that's innate. And that's why the practice of um, calling the guru, or crying to the guru, is invoking then the teacher in this capacity of being the one that embodies enlightenment, but also is not externalized as just being somebody out there that's going to fix everything for us, but rather as as someone who embodies this goodness that we recognize and that touches us deeply. And that is really the heart of what enables us to approach the Vajrayana path. So the, this, um, the text then, intensifying devotion in one's heart, the supplication crying to the gurus from afar, by Jamgun Konto Lodur Thai. So this was this was Jamgun Kontrol was the first of some great extraordinary some extraordinary lamas uh, who have the name Kontrol and down to the present day we have these lamas and also um, also uh, Chigim Trungpa. Uh, it said that the tenth Trungpa was a student of Jamgun Kontrol that's mentioned here, and then Chigim Trungpa himself was 
a, um, a student of Jamgun Kontrol's reincarnation, Hitchin Kontrol. So there was a, a very well, a very close connection between the Trumpas and the and the Kontrols. But of course, Kontrol was such a great master that, for example, also in our Sangha and the, in the in the in the Kinza in the Kinza lineage, if we can talk about. <laughs> something like that then there is then also a very close uh, relationship between the Kinses and the control so control um, had tremendous impact on Tibetan Buddhism in general and was of course part of this um, ecumenical movement the Rime movement um, so Namon Gurave homage to the teacher from, um, no this is Jamgun control writing the practice of crying to the gurus from afar is well known to everyone. The key to invoking blessings is devotion, which is aroused by sadness and renunciation. This is not a mere platitude, but is born in the center of one's heart and in the depths of one's bones, with decisive conviction that there is no other Buddha who is greater than the Guru. Recite this with the melodic tune. Sorry, I'm just going to have to do something about mine. Let's see here. Yes. Uh, recite this melodic tune. And actually, you do have uh, some beautiful uh, liturgies. I think there's this one called. Some of them have sort of been mixed up with a little bit of well, kind of creative music. Um, but basically, there's one called Calling the. the, the this. There is one version of this in Tibetan. Um, chanted by by Lama Gyume, one of Kala Rinpoche's students, and um, it's set to some music, which is quite nice. Anyway, the the Tibetans have some beautiful tunes for this. Um, when we when we talk about sadness and ren renunciation, it's a recognition of the nature of samsara, um, and we. You know, very often you come across this thing, oh, Buddhism says everything is suffering. No, Buddhism does not say everything is suffering, but they're saying there is suffering and you got to do something about it. You know, it's like, you know, if, 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 there's, a, if there's some sort of, I remember there's a place in Nepal where, where everybody had goiters because there was a problem with the drinking water and somebody came in and fixed the drinking water. Well, you could have said it's normal to have goiters, but it's because of the drinking water. So similarly also, yes, there's, there's, there's suffering in samsara for sure, but something needs to be done. Now, sadness is the recognition that such a situation is taking place. I think the Tibetan is kyongel. And the renunciation is then the determination to do something about it. So that's where renunciation is not about running away from to the hills, but it's about just being determined to, to um, pursue liberation for oneself, for others. So, so this is again something that really lies at the core of the of the one's attitude on this journey, and that is where the teacher, who is not externalized as a savior or as some cosmic parental figure, is there, provoking or inciting or inspiring, presenting the possibility of liberation, and that's why the teacher is so important. The teacher is not externalized as, as as the outer person, but is very much seen as basically the manifestation of Buddha nature. And that's why also the teacher is very often represented as Vajradhara or Padmasambhava or Samantabhadra or um, you know any any deity, the Tara or Yeshitsogyal and so forth. The the deity is no other than the teacher. And the uh, teacher is not seen as being anything but then the manifestation of Buddha nature. So calling up to the teacher is not something that enhances duality or some sort of codependent situation with a teacher, but rather it's what dissolves this duality. So, <coughs> so the the practice of calling the guru, guru paying homage to the to the teacher and so forth is actually connecting with this quality of enlightenment uh, within. Of course, we very often think, oh, I don't have enlightenment, but the teacher is really wonderful. And that's where the teacher's point is that you have it. 
the teacher's message is you have it. Please embrace your Buddha nature. That's what the teacher wants us to do. But for the time being, then, because we are fixated on our own impurity, then, yes, it helps to, to objectify this, to temporarily have the reference point of the teacher. So that's why the, um, the teacher is then invoked in the form of enlightenment. So here, then, the, the liturgy begins. Guru, think of me. Kind root, kind root guru, think of me. Lama kieno, lama kieno, chinchin sawe lama kieno. And that kieno is again, sorry, I'm, well, but some of these things, this is really important. So when we say lama kieno or guru, think of me, it really, again, particularly um, brings back this non-duality because we have, we have this, tendency to wish to invoke somebody else or share something we, we're going through whatever we're going through and we like to have somebody we can talk to about it you know we call up our friend we talk about it but you know you can never actually completely convey what it is you're saying now in the case then of the guru we call on somebody but what what is the situation with the guru is the guru is already within ourselves the guru exists non-dual and is privy to everything so we actually needn't begin to sort of hash out everything that has happened to us but simply just invoking the teacher the teacher right away knows everything and this teacher is actually this ground of original purity and it is endowed with all the qualities of enlightenment so from this place then everything you could say is taken care of there's protection there's empowerment there's a blessing etc in that single act of reaching out to the teacher with a recognition that the teacher abides within and that's where we talk about then the, the teachers being kind and that this is what penetrates and breaks through the suffering that normally we are in, sort of completely submersed within so that's where this practice of Lama Kieno, if you're part of the Kamakaju tradition, you would say Kamapa Kieno, meaning same thing, Kamapa, think of me, or Guru, think of me. This is the quintessential Vajrayana mantra, really, in terms of just invoking the very core of the whole, um, the method. So Guru, think of me, kind root Guru, think of me. Essence of the Buddhas of the three times, source of the Holy Dharma, what has been told and what has been experienced, master of the Sangha, the noble assembly, root guru, think of me. So in this sense, then the, the guru is the embodiment of the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, the Buddhas of the three times, past, present and future, the Holy Dharma, what has been told, meaning the what we call Lung, what has been um, transmitted in terms of all the teachings down from the time of the Buddha and what has been uh, experienced, tokpa, um, the um, actual realization. So in this way, the, the Dharma is alive. It's not just a, a set of, of um, prescriptions and teachings, but also um, there's, there's individuals that carry this realization. Master of the Sangha, the Noble Assembly, then the, in this way also the, the teacher embodies the Sangha. Root Guru, think of me. Great treasure of blessings and compassion, source of the two cities, Buddha activity that bestows whatever is desired. Root Guru, think of me. So in the same way also the Guru is the embodiment of the three, what we call the three roots. The Guru being the, uh, the, um, the, the root of blessings, the Yidam, the Yidam deity being the root of the two cities, common and extraordinary, um, or the ordinary cities such as powers and then the supreme city, which is enlightenment, and Buddha activity that bestows whatever is desired, uh, the guru as the root of the, or rather the Dakini, the Dakini as the Dakini in the Dhammapalas as the root of uh, activity the um the the kinis and the you could say the force of the universe um uh, assists those that uh, that keep pure samaya and practice on the practice the vajrayana path guru amitabha think of me look upon me from the realm of dharmakaya simplicity lead us evil 
lead us of evil karma who wander in samsara to the pure land of great bliss. Um, okay, we'll do that next time. Okay. So then we begin with chapter one, which is then the tantric practitioner. So in my Kindle edition, the Tanka image here of, is of um, Jamgun Kontro. So, all right. Chapter one, the tantric practitioner. So Tumba Ramaji says, the tantric teachings of Buddhism are extremely sacred and in some sense, inaccessible. Tantric practitioners of the past have put tremendous energy and effort into the study of Tantra. Now we are bringing Tantra to North America, which is a landmark in the history of Buddhism. So we cannot afford to make our own studies into supermarket merchandise. Now, famously, Tantra is so colorful that it is often hijacked in numerous ways, whether it's sort of tantric sex workshops or just the sort of the general decor, great tankas, tankas make for or would make for great, you know, decorations in, in, uh, in homes and uh, all, all sorts of um, interesting tantric ideas also sort of um, make their way into to our uh, common language and, um, and so forth. But it very often is of course hijacked and sort of mixed up um, with, the, with the cliches of our own uh, you know, cultural predispositions and assumptions. So <clears throat> it definitely needs to be, uh, Tantra needs to be approached in the context of the general Buddhist vehicle. And also Tantra itself is a tremendous science of understanding the phenomenal world and the purity innate to the phenomenal world. So if we look down th through the history of Tantrism, what is extraordinary, just like we have it in Buddhism, is that um, the masters, uh, the great realized yogis and yoginis of the lineage, again and again have confirmed the discoveries of those who went before. So we don't really, it's not as if we have a stagnant um, science here, but it's just that it's such a rich science and it is so true and so valid. And so there's a continual um, appreciation of this lack of confusion that um, that runs through the tantric insight and that again and again is celebrated. And so you have tantric masters uh, continually uh, celebrating the, for example, the Dohas, the, the Vajra songs of realization of the masters of India uh, down to the present day and throughout the, the history of Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, you have this continual um, consolidated vision of um, the presence of enlightenment as it penetrates the world and which is reflected in then uh, continual um, songs, uh, expressions, ways or teachings, uh, commentaries and so on. There's an incredibly rich culture down to the present day. My own teacher, Dilgu Kanzarimaja, his, he left behind 25 uh, volumes of, um, of teachings, uh, basically uh, not repetitions, but you know, um, celebrating the, the, the teachings of all the, the masters of the past. Uh, Chigam Trungpa himself, before he came out of Tibet, um, uh, had written an uh, enormous amount of um, teachings and treasure teachings and so on, celebrating this. So we have an, a, a very rich um, culture, a very rich science. So it's very important that this doesn't get turned into, like Tumbram just says, to supermarket merchandise. Trungpa continues, a tantric revolution took place in India many centuries ago. The wisdom of that tradition has been handed down orally from generation to generations by, great, by the great Mahasiddhas or tantric masters. Therefore, Tantra is known as the ear whispered or secret lineage. However, the notion of secrecy does not imply that Tantra is like a foreign language. It's not as if our parents speak it's not as though our parents speak two languages, but they only teach us English so that they can use Chinese or Yiddish when they want to keep a secret from us. <laughs> Rather, Tantra introduces us to the actuality of the phenomenal world. It is one of the most advanced, sharp, and extraordinary perceptions that has ever developed. 
It is unusual and eccentric. It is powerful, magic, magical, and outrageous. But it is also extremely simple. So the scope of this science is founded on the absence of delusion. And with the insight into the nature of reality, with the falling away of this ignorance that misconstrues our own subjective experience and also our perception of the world, with the falling away of that, then the phenomenal world arises in what we call the aspect of luminosity. And it's this insight into how the reality actually is that then is the foundation of the tantric science. We have, and this science, by the way, is no less empirical, if you like, than the materialist science that we often operate with within our, you could say, confined materialist science. The thing about empiricism is that it's not speculative. It's not based on met metaphysics. It is not based on belief. Of course, what is controversial here is that in Buddhism, the science is not something that can be quantified, measured, objectified, but it doesn't make it less, you could say, verifiable in the sense of it being experienced. It's not in the realm of belief or wishful thinking and so forth. So the tantric science and the Buddhist science in general is not confined to just what can be objectified and uh, measured, quantified, and so on, but extends beyond that. And of course, the insight here is that what we very often think of in terms of there being an actual objective reality is really based on a delusional assumption. This, of course, is something that we, within Western science, have known since over a hundred years from quantum physics that it's not as if the objective external world is is uh, separated from um, from consciousness in a sort of what they call causal closure that that mind and matter stand apart they're interactive and this of course in the buddhist context is where we understand that the so-called solid external reality is not as solid as we think we have that already in the at the very basis of the buddhist journey in our analysis of the skandhas and particularly then in the understanding of majamika in the middle way we realize that there is nothing that we can objectify and so with that with that understanding that that um, there is nothing that actually exists beyond just us labeling a particular reality, we realize that this assumption around a solid world is delusional. And so to talk about a science is very questionable if we still are suffering or still confined to a, a delusional assumption about, about a reality that actually doesn't exist. So from the, from, from the Buddhist point of view, a sort of a materialist science that only asserts this sort of confined scope of the material, objectifiable and measurable um, qualities is actually a very limited science. What we have in, in Tantra, however, is an unlimited, a science that's not limited by this uh, delusion, by this projection, by this misunderstanding reality. So in that sense, um, we also have, since the time of the Buddha, um, we understand that this is not something that can be just approached in terms of just looking at it, but it's something that needs to be experienced. But of course, experience is the most basic, basic quality of our existence. And so from the time of the Buddha up to today, masters who have then seen this and had this experience share and nod sort of in, in, in agreement to what the Buddha found. Whereas when you have the object, the sort of the materialist science, you're always going to be confused because you're always the the observer is still confused. So you have a science that's doing leaps and bounds and here and there, and you know, there's there's not as if there is some sort of linear progression towards greater and greater understanding. It's a very haphazard phenomenon, even within the scientific community. We have people like Thomas Kuhn and Michel Foucault have ex exposed the sort of very cultural constructed nature of our science. So, so, um, so that's where we'd want to have the deepest respect for the tantric masters who actually penetrated to an understanding of reality and have continued to do so down until the present day. There's nothing stagnant about this science or nothing cultural about it. It's about discovering the actual nature of, of how things are when, when you take away this delusion, this 
confused subjective uh, fixation. So we're looking, we're walking into a very vast landscape of a greater reality when we approach this this dimension of Tantra. So from our conventional view, we can talk about it as magical and we can talk about it as being um, sort of, um, well, we can't really call it supernatural because it is still within just a greater nature. It's part of a greater science. But certainly from our conventional point of view, it is powerful, magical and outrageous. But again, and this is the important point and what always come back to all along the, the journey of Buddhism is that it's extremely simple. It is what is originally there. It is, it is the insight that originates when the mind is no longer caught up in all its elaborations and constructions and projections and when the mind is connected to the basic, to its own basic simplicity. It's then that reality opens up. So we needn't think of Tantra as being something that's very complex, even though it might appear. And of course, all the Buddhist methods and paths could look very complex, but they're all founded actually on connecting with this unconfused basic simplicity that is our innate nature. So, so in order to understand the phenomenon of Tantra, or tantric consciousness, we should be quite clear that we're not talking about tantra, tantra as a vague spiritual process. Tantra of Vajrayana Buddhism is extremely precise and it is unique. We cannot afford to jumble the Vajrayana into a spiritual or philosophical stew. Instead, we should discuss Tantra technically, spiritually and personally in a very exact sense. And we should discuss what is, we should discuss what the uniqueness of the tantric tradition has to offer to sentient beings. So again, this is something that is premised on us actually dealing with our experience. And we certainly shouldn't uh, sort of um, just misconstrue Tantra to being something that we can, that we can just sort of uh, put together with whatever our um, wishful thinking is or whatever the, the particular trend that tends to be happen and then sort of incorporate a bigger bit of Tantra just because there's something that sort of might appeal to us or sort of ring true or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very precise science and it's very much based on a very intimate relationship um, or a very intimate relationship in terms of our experience. So it's very, very precise. So, um, so it's important that we appreciate Tantra not as a, oh, yeah, this is an interesting Tibetan thing, you know, how could we, how could we appropriate that? It needs to be discussed on its own terms. It needs to be understood properly. Okay. Let's see if there's any questions. Okay, this will continue here next time. Um, are there ways to undo a bit of the guilt or understand guilt that may drive some of our actions that also align with Dharma, for example, generosity and so on? Yes, there are ways. And that's where it's important that we don't practice Dharma or um, that we uh, practice uh, the practices, I mean, that, that we engage in the practices of Dharma um, as a moralistic project. You know, that's where moralism is, is difficult because that's, that's where there's some absolute, this is how it should be, and thus thou should do like this and like that, right? And then if you fail, then there's a sense that I am apart from this absolute how things ought to be, and here I am, I'm how it, I, I'm how it ought not to be. So that divide uh, is, is basic to a lot of the moralistic uh, ways of understanding it we should understand that we are confused. And so on the basis of our confusions, we are predictably going to be stumbling. So that's just, that's, that's understandable. It's like, if you're going to build a house, you're going to come across rocks, you're going to come across things that get in the way. And they're kind of, they are things that 
you know, you'd say they shouldn't be here. These rocks shouldn't be here. I want to build a house and the rocks shouldn't be here. Well, it's, you know, you're going to build a house. It's going to be all sorts of things coming up. You're going to work with your mind. You're going to have to work with the fact that we are temporarily uh, in a delusional condition that very much drives uh, these various toxic uh, conditions. That doesn't mean that though we should accept them in the sense that, okay, I can't change that because these are very workable. This is something that we're actually we're talking a lot about in the context of the Abhidharma, that we begin to understand the constructed nature of our confusion. And so it's workable. So our shortcomings, what makes us feel guilty, are um, conditions that are very workable. But we should never feel that the, that the raw material of who we are, that there's something flawed in that. That's... that's um, that, that's sort of a leftover from, you could say, moralism. And that's where we need to distinguish in between practice of the Dharma and some of the, the practices of moralism. So for when it comes to generosity, we should really understand that generosity is aligned. When we practice generosity, we are aligning ourselves with our true nature. We're naturally generous. But what gets in the way is our, our poverty mentality that thinks, oh, I can't give this away, or we're sort of habituated to say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and we, if we can see the sort of the neurosis of that, and then also begin to gently, compassionately work with that, then, then, then it's, uh, it's very, very doable. Hope that makes sense. Devotions to gurus, plural, more than one teacher. Well, that's actually a very good question. In some sense, uh, you could say the the external gurus are really just a display of enlightenment. But there's there's um, there's a sense that they all are one. We would say all the Buddhas and all the gurus are one within the expanse of wisdom. So within the expanse of the purity of our own mind, all the gurus are there without, like you would say, without being mixed up or anything. But also, and this is an impo another important point about lineage, because what we're going to do in this, in this liturgy, look at all the many great masters there were, both in the Indian and the Tibetan tradition, particularly the Tibetan tradition, um, is actually that we have persons that undertook the journey and who, um, who, even though they lived in a different culture, which is very, very secondary, and uh, even though it was Buddhist culture, then the the core of what they did is something that we share with them. They worked with their neurosis, they worked with their, um, you know, their, their clashes and so forth. So we're, we are undertaking this uh, as part of a lineage of persons that just like we have Buddha nature and yet uh, recognizing confusion decided to do something about it. So we look to the, to this lineage and the teachers really as an inspiration. So that's where, we look at many different teachers and all of them provide a source of inspiration. Um, Jakob, I have a recording of Sansa Jamikens Rinpoche chanting, calling the gurus from afar, from early days at the Gompa. If you do not have it and would like it, I can send it to you. Well, that's very kind of you. Um, I guess if you, what we could do is upload it to the, um, we can upload it to the, um, to the to the resource folder. I think I have I made a resource folder yet. Anyway, I'll I'll do that. So if you send it to me, um, we can have that. There's something very important I'd like to tell all of you, and of course this I should have done right at the beginning, and I, I'll, I should repeat it next time also. There are recordings of this seminar that Chigam Trumpa gave back at Naropa Institute back in 1974. So these recordings can be found in, um, on a website called The Chronicles. Somebody sent me the link and look, I'll, I'll be coming back to this because this needs to be said over and over again. But you have the recordings of Chirigam Trumpa teaching this. And this of course is enormously valuable. Now that is something that could be a, a cause of, um, of blessings. You know, just seeing Trumpa Ramaji actually teach this. So please uh, Google it. Chigyam Trumpa, Journey to Enlightenment, 
um, so forth. You should, you should, there should be a link uh, coming up that will take you to to the chronicles, and in, in there you have these recordings. And there's there's a lot of them. I mean, I think the entire. I was speaking to Larry Mermelstein the other day, and he was saying that the the entire um, the entire um, teaching, which ran over, must have run over quite some time, um, is complete there. So please, please have a look at that. Like I say, I'll. I'll make the. Um, I should put a. I'll put a link up, or at least I'll be. Um, yeah, I can put a link up. I think. <laughs> anyway, I'll be talking it up a bit. Good. Question: How is intention and agenda different? Uh, how do we have intention without an agenda? How is the guru knowing everything non-dual? Well, two questions, okay. Well, the first is really a question of language, and you are asking me, who's a, who's Danish, to distinguish between some English terms. Well, okay, thanks for the vote of confidence. Um, all right, intention, uh, that is what we want, right? Uh, in terms of our motivation. Uh, similarly with agenda, there's probably somebody who could come up with, uh, you know, the the uh, you know the the Oxford definition of this, um, and I would actually recommend you to look in a dictionary. Um, certainly in Buddhism, they're pretty synonymous, really. Intention and agenda—it's what we wish, what we want. Yeah. Agenda is like plotting. Yeah, agenda is like plotting. Yeah, yeah. How can we? How 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 do we have an intention without an agenda? <laughs> Okay, well, okay, yes. There's a little bit of a an added, There's a little bit of a pejorative sense of agenda in the sense of there's a self-centering. Yeah, I suppose intention implies is more neutral, and agenda is that there's more of a self-involved. Okay, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, how is how is the guru knowing everything non-dual? Because ultimately, the guru abides within ourselves. This is, of course, the point of the whole of Buddhism. Buddha abides within, the Buddha within, right? So that's where the, the so that's where the, 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 um, the guru, the guru, the, um, when we talk about the guru, we are, of course, talking about somebody who is showing us something, but the thing is, they're showing us, they're pointing up, you know, they're pointing to something within. So that is where the, the teacher, is pointing to that which is beyond the notion of um, this and that self and other. Yeah. So that's where this this presence of the teacher it speaks to something within ourselves, which is a nature of wisdom. When we are deeply touched by meet, meeting a teacher, we don't think of the teacher. Oh, yeah, this person was born in Tibet. This person was born there. This person is so and so. We don't objectify them as such. The place where there's devotion and blessing is where these sort of ordinary concepts melt away. And there's a deep sense of union with the teacher that has nothing to do with the sort of external references and the dualistic references. Yeah. Um, and then someone says, I'm happy to go over time. Good. If it means people's questions are answered with care, this helps everyone and can potentially be reviewed in recordings for those who must finish on the hour. Well, exactly, yeah, so we'll do that. Good, I'm glad I have that that's okay with some of you. Please, can you say something about a difference between Vajra nature and Buddha nature? Well, I think I'd be a little bit reluctant actually. It'll be, I, in general, we can, we can, uh, we would say they're synonymous, but possibly there is some, some th where we could say Buddha nature more aligns itself with the general teachings and Vajra nature is more about the luminosity. Maybe Buddha nature has a little bit more to do with Shunyata, Vajra nature has a little bit more to do with Vajra nature, but again, it's very, it's very much uh, synonymous. Yeah. Anyway, there's a whole chapter on Vajra nature coming up, so I think certainly Vajra nature will be clarified at that point. Could you please address the feeling of guilt, which is so prevalent from a Christian background regarding not doing the practice correctly or often enough? 
Maybe you are addressing it already. Yeah, well, it's, it's something that comes up a lot. And of course, um, this is basic to the di division. Di this is where Buddhism parts from Christian background. So the moment that we're approaching Buddhism, we're actually we're leaving some of the uh, Christian assumptions away. So in approaching uh, Buddhism, uh, don't expect the Christian definitions to apply. We, we, we work with a very different uh, we're working with a, with a sense of um, can do and uh, and also uh, not really good versus evil and this is this is very important once we have that then actually um, when we have once we have that and that's basic this is really you know this is well this is really the, the basic teachings of Buddhism so like I say we can't confuse Christianity and Buddhism and so, um, so when we in the, the Buddhist teaching prescribe things that we need to do, it's on the basis of not good versus bad, but rather just in terms of that we are empowered to do something about our condition of not being well, suffering, etc. So we don't do it because there's a prescription that it ought to be like that. Uh, from the point of view, there's some uh, it's an imposition where you just sort of say, okay, I will do like that. But you do so from the from an educated point of view. Just like if you educate yourself in nutrition, then it's you could say you feel guilty if you eat that chocolate bar, you know, the Mars bar or whatever. Um, yeah, you can feel guilty. And, you know, that's all right because you needn't do it. But it's not as if you're a bad person because you ate a Mars bar. You just know I was silly and I needn't do this. So in that way, the, it, it comes with uh, guilt if it's just sort of like stuck as a little sort of hard chunk of sort of I am bad. Um, that's a problem. But when we begin to understand the complexity of it, and that's what we're in Buddhism, we talk about working with dependent origination and understanding the conditioned nature of things. That's where we, we where this this vision of complexity opens up for a much more intelligent and informed way of understanding um, what actions need to be to be um, pursued. So if we've studied um, if we've studied nutrition and we then are sort of pigging out on on ice cream and <laughs> and unhealthy food, you know, that makes every it makes plenty of sense to feel guilty just from the point of view that it's stupid and we needn't do it. But there's not a sense of us being, uh, how do you say, beyond that. It's not like we're defined in terms of being bad. It's just that we could actually, um, we could choose, we could choose a wiser, <laughs> some wiser action. I hope that makes sense. Um, hi, Jakob. Here's your reminder to let people know that the original talks from Journey, from Journey Without Goal, given at Naropa Institute, can be watched online on the Pro Chronicle Project website. Thank you very much. So the um, the URL is, well, I'm not gonna read that all out, but it's basically chronicleproject.com and journey without goal. So go on the Chronicles, which is chronicleproject.com and their journey without goal. Thank you very much. If Tantra has to be approached through the general vehicle of Buddhism, uh, is to the general is graded and apparently dangerous. Why do teachers teach Vajrayana straight off the bat to students who have no idea or context about what it is? Um, oh, you know, it's it's sad that does happen. Of course, teachers who are uh, who are um, who know their audience well, um, they they do what they care for the audience. They, 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 they know what to do, but you sometimes have the situation of um, Asian teachers, and I'm particularly familiar with the Tibetan teachers who come in and just out of their heart's goodness begin to teach Vajrayana um, and really do so out of their heart's uh, uh, goodness. But of course, it's, it's a little bit of a, a situation of misunderstanding and the students they don't really understand the teacher. The teacher doesn't really understand the students. And that's where then you have this unfortunate situation with 
Vajrayana, you have some brilliant teachers like Jagam Chumpa and also uh, other teachers who really have been very discerning in terms of uh, preparing the students properly. But it's rare to find a teacher like Jagam Chumpa to, who to such an extent actually understood the Western neurosis and also understood the Western strengths. Because very often what you also have is then the Tibetans sort of give Vajrayana teachings to the students, the students who are completely confused and don't know what to do, they sort of give up on it eventually. Or they sort of go into sort of strange way of plotting out their own path on the basis of this. Then they sort of, they, then the Tibetans will go, oh gosh, these Westerners, you know, they just, they just don't get it, you know. But it's, it's really mutual. It's, it's a question of difficulty in translation. Things get lost in translation and they're, you know, mishaps that happen in translation. So thank you. Someone is saying Lama Gyume chanting this liturgy here is on Spotify. Oh, good. Thanks. Um, may I ask, please, how many are online with us this morning? Do you know from how many different countries? Well, that is a rather, well, okay. That's, we are, about, well, we're 98 people right now. So, uh, but I can, we have sometimes done a little bit of a roll call where everybody's from. They're pretty much from everywhere. Yeah. So 98 people right now. Um, yeah. Chroniclesproject.com. Yes, that's where you can find it. Can we also be can we also can we also be given in the resources folder, a high resolution folder, a photo of Chirgam Trumpa to, to be printed? Uh, the picture that I have this 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 week of Trumpa image is uh, just something I Googled just before. And it's uh, I think a fairly high res picture. Uh, if you if you use if you go in Google and you find a high resolution picture, um, you can print it. <laughs> I'm happy to put this one up as well though. No problem. It's it's public domain, so I guess that's all right. Yeah. Sure. Um, the Chronicles also do weekly excerpted quotes that can go on one's email box. Okay, I didn't know that. They used to have this Ocean of Dharma uh, email that would go out. Okay, then somebody's um, defining this thing about agenda and intention. Intention is immediate agenda. Okay, intention is immediate. Agenda is projection. Ah, oh, that's interesting. That's right, yes. Intention is something we can work with, right? It has, they can, yeah, yeah, agenda is more about what might happen in the future. Interesting, thank you very much. Some interesting points about this, obviously. Um, could you comment on the balance between doing one's practice properly and trying to engage with every practice that is made available to us? Well, there's a lot of teachings that are available, just like if you go into the supermarket, famously, we have a lot of, you know, let's just say the cereals, breakfast cereals, right? So they're all available to you, but you probably have found a particular breakfast cereal that you're fond of, and that's probably what you're gonna use. So I think that's how it applies. We're gonna, we need to, we need to, um, we have a relationship to a teacher, we have a particular way of doing things, and we, we stick with that. So, um, so we particularly then use what works. Um, I wonder why some teachers teach Vajrayana openly, like when the Dalai Lama uh, does public color chakra teachings. Well, then the color chakra teaching again is a different category because even though it is Vajrayana of the highest kind, actually, there's also this, and this is common to Tibetan culture, there's said to be a lot of blessing, there's said to be a lot of value, and even giving the empowerment is said to promote world peace. Even the fact that the Dalai Lama goes ahead and gives this is good for the world. And in fact, also Vajrayana empowerment being given, you could say, is good for the world. We could also say that people can take empowerments as blessings. So that's why um, the Dalai Lama would teach this to anybody. But of course, the Kala Chakra is actually an amazing, that is really a science. And so we have so much insight about, you could say, the external phenomenal world, the, the dimension of our body, the dimension of our mind uh, that, is, um, so that is documented and um, and taught in the in the color chakra. Uh, 
But yes, it is, it is then taught or given openly because it's said that there's a lot of value in presenting it. So that's where we would, we would say even we can attend the, the Kala Chakra teaching, we just think I'm t receiving this as a blessing. Uh, again, some people are kindly giving the, the URL for the Chronicle project with Journey Without Goal. How do you spell Lama Gyume? Uh, yeah, it's Lama is correct. And then G-Y-U-R-M-E. Okay, and then somebody says Pinterest is a, is has good photos. Okay. All right, I think we we're there. So we went a little bit over time, but I think that's all right. Thank you very much for. Um, would you consider teaching us on the science of the Kala Chakra? No. Um, well, <laughs> very. <laughs> thank you for the vote of confidence, but I think I might pass on that. That is. That's an enormous science. You could you could just as well have asked me to teach you on astrophysics, and uh, I would sort of uh, I'd have to decline. I I'm not quite qualified. All right. So some of you, um, yes, yeah, somebody's asking where is the resource folder, please. Okay, you have in the the mail that I sent to you, not the one you get when you register, but the mail that I initially sent to everybody. Uh, you would have gotten. Um, there, there's two links. One is to register. The other one is takes you directly to a Dropbox where you have all the um, where you have the material. And I don't know if if there's any material as of yet. So if there isn't one, I'll put it up right now. And um, basically, then you can find material that I refer to or that I think could be helpful in terms of this study. I'll put that up there. Okay. Dedication. Did I? I might put up the dedication. I'm not sure I have. Here we go. Through this virtue, may all beings throughout existence awaken together without a single being left behind. In the pure realm of the luminous essence, the ground of the great perfection, may they remain inseparable from the kayas and wisdoms. Through all our births, wherever we may be born, may we be endowed with the seven good qualities of the higher realms. As soon as we are born, may we meet with the Dharma and have the freedom to practice it properly. At that time, may we please the holy gurus and practice the Dharma throughout the day and night. Realizing the Dharma and accomplishing its essential meaning, may we cross the ocean of existence in that life. Thoroughly teaching the holy Dharma in this world, may we never tire of accomplishing the benefit of others. By this vast benefit of others, without partiality or bias, may all attain Buddhahood together. Thank you. <laughs>